John chapter 6. I want to begin reading in verse 36, 37, excuse me, verse 37 and read through verse 47. We're we'll focusing our attention on verses 41 through 47. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I will in no wise cast out. For I came down from heaven, not to do mine own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which hath sent me, that of all which he hath given me, I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of Him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on Him may have everlasting life, and I will raise Him up at the last day. The Jews then murmured at Him, because He said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he saith, I came down from heaven? Now, if modern day church folk had been there that day, that wouldn't have been the thing they would have been grumbling about, murmuring about. They would have been murmuring about, what does that mean, all that the Father giveth me shall come to me, right? That's, that's not what these fellows were murmuring about. They were murmuring about something that to them was even more fundamental, more basic, at least in their minds. And that is who this fellow is that's speaking. Who is he? Who does he think he is? Jesus therefore answered and said unto them, Murmur not among yourselves. That murmuring there is the idea of, they were sort of like, in fact it's kind of, it's used in the sense of, of fluttering, like quails fluttering, or this just sort of, just sort of dull rumble among the Jews. You know, when something um, fantastic happens and you hear the, dull roar in the crowd, just everyone just sort of, you know, talking about it among themselves. That's what's going, that's what this idea of murmuring here is about. So Jesus says, don't, don't murmur among yourselves. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It's really kind of remarkable to hear this response. Don't murmur among yourselves. And then he says what he says here, which may seem to have, you might wonder, why is he saying that? But I, I really do believe he's fundamentally answering the concern that these Jews have about who he is. He's still focused on this idea of I'm the one that was sent and I'm going to raise, I'm going to accomplish the mission. You just don't realize who I am. It's written in the prophets and they shall be all taught of God. Again, it seems sort of a strange truth to reach back into the Old Testament and bring forward at this point. But it is the point. The point of who He is in relationship to the Father. He is God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father, cometh unto me. Not that any man hath seen the Father. You see, this is, again, it's a, it seems strange for this statement to be here unless you understand what Jesus is doing, what the point is that He's 
that he's making. Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. And so, essentially, I've seen him. I'm talking to you. You're listening to me, you're hearing the Father, you're hearing God, right? Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the bread of life. What a remarkable thing for Jesus to say at this point. He sort of comes away from this deep thought that he has just led everyone into to conclude, at least I'm concluding the message here today, but he, he, he gives this basic, simple appeal. He that believeth on me hath everlasting life. I am the Alpha and Omega. It all begins and ends with me, Jesus is saying. You need to understand who I am. In this passage, Jesus is interacting with Jews who are seeking after Him. Following that miraculous feeding of the 5,000 plus, with five loaves of bread and a few fish, truly an amazing event, I suppose, had we been there that day, and if we were a Jew, we would probably be with these folks. This man is... Something's different about him. Something is unique about him. Maybe he's the one that's going to answer the needs that we have. They were excited. They were pursuing him. But they were pursuing him for reasons that were temporal and political, not spiritual. They didn't view themselves as sinners in need before a holy God. And this is really going to come out clearly as we continue through this gospel. They didn't need a Savior that could reconcile them to God. They didn't see themselves to be at odds with God. What they saw themselves to need was a remedy to their economic and political crises. And so as Jesus reveals Himself as the one sent from heaven to give life, He repeatedly says that, not only here, but it's, this is repeated throughout this gospel, the, the words of Jesus and the words of others. They reject Him. As it becomes more clear to them what He's really saying, as He identifies Himself more clearly, they reject Him. Not much has changed, really. Many today are seeking for remedies to life's problems who do not see their greatest need in relation to our Creator God. That They don't really see God. And so when God is more clearly unveiled and when Jesus Christ is more clearly proclaimed, there is a resistance. Lord, I ask you, what is your response to God when you find out that your biggest problem is not what you think it is? Your biggest problem is not a better marriage. Your biggest problem is not a better job or a better car. A better situation in life. A, a great healing. That is not your biggest problem. Your biggest problem has to do with who you are before God. Your biggest problem is your sin. And and so how do you respond? How do you react when you find that Jesus is a Savior of sinners? He he is not somebody who just multiplies bread for you. He's not somebody who just fills your empty belly. He he doesn't just tend to your felt needs. What, What happens when you find out that He is a Savior of Sinners. Well, the same thing that happened 
here with these Jews often happens today. Folks flee a message like that. They, they run from it. They don't want it. They, they want to find a place where they can go and hear somebody give a religious talk that builds them up, that satisfies them, and that will guarantee them something in this a better life now, right? But Jesus is not discouraged or dismayed by the unbelief of these Jews. You notice he doesn't change his message. He just, and that's one thing you see in John chapter 6. He just keeps pounding. He just keeps coming at them. And really, he, he doesn't lighten things. He doesn't even, he doesn't try to move the message in a direction that would be more palatable. He actually moves the message in a way that is more offensive. We're not going to get there today, but he, he, we will get there. He doesn't give them what they want. He gives them what they need, not what they want. And he, he boldly asserts that his mission will be successful. They will not stop him from completing his mission successfully. I will raise him up at the last day is repeated by Jesus in this message. I'm going to accomplish my purpose. The will of my Father. The reason I came. I believe verses 41 through 47 are recorded to confirm and I think clarify what has already been stated in these previous verses. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me. And him that cometh to me, I'll in no wise cast out. I came down to do the will of my Father, and so forth. I didn't come to do my own will. I came to do the will of my Father. And he and he's emphasized in those previous verses the relationship that he has with his Father. And so he continues this thought in verses 41 through 47 as he reacts, responds to the reaction of the Jews to what he's been saying. And in these verses, it seems that Jesus pulls the curtain back to clue us in on the miraculous work of salvation. I mean, the feeding of the 5,000 was a miraculous work. Salvation is a more miraculous work. Now, you wouldn't think so to listen to a lot of religious teachers today, but Jesus is showing us here in these verses that indeed it is miraculous. It's a greater work than what most who go under the name of Christian today, realize. And God could have hidden these things from us as He did what He chose to do. That is, all that the Father gives to the Son will come to the Son. That could have all happened and God never revealed that to us. You know, He, he could have just revealed the message. The gospel, 1 Corinthians 15, you know, the simple gospel message. Just present the message, there it is, and do all of these things behind the scene that he must do, but keep it hidden from us. But he didn't do that. That's why I'm saying he pulls the curtain back here a little bit and he shows us some behind the scenes work in this, in this thing of salvation. He wants us to know that our coming to Christ is the result of His plan being worked out and His direct and gracious involvement in our lives. He wants us to know as much as we can fathom and understand, and there's mystery here. I just read a devotion this morning about the making of stars. Scientists know some things about the making of stars, but there's a lot they don't know. How how are stars formed? They just, they don't know. They have ideas. They're still uncovering this thing, how stars are born or how they were born. But we know they exist because we see their light. And so it is with those who are born again, those who are God's children. There's some mystery surrounding it. We we don't have all all the answers to all the questions. I don't think we even have all the questions. But But we know that that it happens because we see. We, we see those who are born again, don't we? We see the transformation. We, we see the light that comes from their lives. Greater or lesser. Which statement could take me in a whole 
other path this morning, and I'm not going there. But coming to Christ is far more than a mere intellectual decision or a decision that is dependent merely upon the conveyance of information. It is the result of divine intervention. God involving Himself directly in lives. So Jesus' interaction here with these unbelieving Jews, I believe, is representative of mankind at large. And there are two primary points that I see. One is, there's a fundamental problem. And the second is, there is a miraculous solution. And then we'll close by looking at a gracious appeal. The fundamental problem. These Jews were being confronted with a man who is claiming to have come down from heaven. Put yourself in their shoes. He's claiming that he has seen the Father. He's claiming that if they believe him, they would have everlasting life. I don't think it should probably surprise us that their response is that they murmur among themselves. It, it didn't add up to their minds. They, they, they knew this, this man's parents. Verse 42. Is not this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it that he says, I came down from heaven? He claims to have heavenly origin. That seemed ludicrous to them. And it's not that they didn't believe that there were special men sent from God like Moses and Elijah. In fact, they were actually looking for a Messiah, one like Moses or one like David. But Jesus well, when I say one like David, I mean of the seed of David, of the lineage of David. So they were looking for that. Jews were not biblically ignorant. But Jesus was saying that he was superior to Moses. He wasn't just like unto Moses, meaning there's an equality. He's greater than Moses. He's not just coming to give bread. You see, they saw Moses as the one who gave the bread, though Jesus corrects them and says, no, Moses didn't do that. My father gave you that bread. But they thought Moses was the originator. But Jesus is coming and saying, I'm not just coming to give you bread. I am the bread. I'm the true bread from heaven. He didn't just have heaven's authority. He was heaven's authority. You see? He was from heaven. Heaven didn't come down and fill his soul. He is heaven come down. They saw him as merely a man. Obviously, they were seeing that there was something unusual or unique about him. But when he started describing them, explaining to them what that uniqueness really was all about, they began to be troubled because they knew that he grew up in Joseph and Mary's household. This is the little boy that they, that they knew his parents. Some of them probably had even interacted with Jesus as a younger person. Who does he think he is? The Jews then murmured, trying to figure out what he was actually saying as he said the things that he said. And it's not going to get any easier for them as Jesus, as the passage continues, as we'll see. But I believe also there is skepticism, to say the least, that is building. Skepticism of his 
I would call this religious skepticism. These were religious men. They, they weren't atheists. They had a concept of, of God, of Jehovah. But there was a skepticism that fills their, their minds. And they, and they, at least from a natural point of view, were justified in their skepticism. They knew this man's parents. They could only see the earthly origins. They couldn't see who Jesus really was. He was telling them who He was. I came down from heaven. Oh, you didn't hear me the first time? I came down from heaven. Oh, you didn't get it? I came. He repeats Himself over and over. I was sent. I was sent. Three times, I believe. I was sent. And so Jesus says, murmur not among yourselves. I don't know that I have fully understood why Jesus says that to them, why that is the response. Murmur not among yourselves. But I I concluded this, my own take. All the talk, all the discussion, all the debate, all the questioning will never adequately answer the heart of unbelief. Discuss it all you want, boys. Analyze it. Up one side and down the other. That is not how you're going to know me as I am and come to me. That's not it. That's not how it's going to happen. To see Jesus requires eyes of faith. The insight of faith, doesn't it? And John has already addressed that in John chapter 3. And, 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 and remember, John is writing this as a package, the Gospel of John. So the readers have read chapter 3. And now we're coming to chapter 6. And so we've already heard, you must be born again. Unless you're born again, you cannot see the kingdom of God. You can't see Jesus Christ for who He is. Left to your own natural, mental capacity, you will see no more than these Jews saw. By the way, you may embrace some doctrinal teaching that you were brought up with about who Jesus is, but you won't really see it. You live the rest of your life questioning and arguing and murmuring. And you'll do Google searches to find out others who are murmuring, right? Complaining. This doesn't make sense. I don't get it. Is there anybody else out there that doesn't get it? And so you form a little camp that you can share your thoughts with those others who don't get it. You must be born again. If you are not born again, you will reason as these Jews reasoned and many since have reasoned. Jesus did great things. Most, except for the extreme atheists, do not deny that Jesus actually lived. There are those who still are on that track, but that's pretty much been debunked. Just believing that Jesus did great things is far different from believing, seeing, embracing this reality that He's the bread which came down from heaven. Everlasting life is through Him alone, alone, alone. Solo Christo. Christ alone. Jesus states the universal problem here, doesn't He, in verse 44? No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him, and I will raise him up at the last day. No man can come to me. No man. None. No exception. No man can come to me. matters not your heritage, your birth line. doesn't matter. No man can. He's saying this to Jews. If anybody could, it would be them. If any man could. 
But Jesus says, no man can. A word of ability. It's the translation of the Greek word dunamis. Do you hear dynamite in that? Jesus wants us to know our helpless condition. We don't want to hear about our helpless condition. No man wants to, no man wants to hear that they're helpless if left to themselves. No one wants to. I, I, I don't want to hear that, frankly. I can help myself if I want to help myself. After all, I'm an American, right? And in America, you can have it your way. You can do what you want. We're, we're, we're brought up thinking that way. And so when Jesus says no man can, there's this attitude, well, I will. I'll show him. I'll prove him wrong. You know, there's this sense of rebellion against what Jesus says. No man can come. This is not the only place this is stated in Scripture. Romans chapter 8 might help to see a couple of other Scriptures where this same word of inability is spoken. Romans chapter 8, verses 7 and 8, because the carnal mind is enmity against God. That's the mind. The carnal mind is the mind with which we were born. It's not subject to the law of God, neither indeed what is that? That's a word. Of, that's the same word. Can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot, cannot please God. It's not possible. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In verse 14. But the natural man... That's who you are by birth. The natural man receives not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither, there's our word again, can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. There is a natural inability. The point is, is not that many want to come to Christ, but can't. That is not what the Scriptures are teaching. Rather, there's something within each of us that resists the person and resists the terms of the gospel. There is something in us that, that goes sideways, that resists this idea that I can't make it on my own. And listen, in the process of what you're hearing me say, if you're feeling yourself shrinking with a feeling or sense of, of helplessness, and if you come to the place where you cry, what can I do? You're in a good place, but Jesus wants you to come to that place. There is, there is help, but it's not in you. You see, to come to Christ means that we must accept His claims. That is about who He is. And by nature, we would murmur with the Jews about His claim. Virgin born? God and man in, in, in one person? Two natures? Does that make sense to you? And so there's the murmuring about this one who claims to be sent from heaven, God in the flesh, to bring eternal life. The only way. But to come to Christ means we accept His claims. To come to Christ means we would, we would have to admit our great need that we can't meet. To come to Christ means we would have to give up the rule of our lives and surrender to Him. Do you see why the Scriptures say we cannot? The fact is, we cannot come to Christ if the decision were left merely to us. We would not. That's the problem. 
without elaborating any further. That's the problem. What's the solution? There is a miraculous solution, and it's given to us here. No man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. And I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Every man, therefore, that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto me, except the Father which hath sent me draw him. The Father must draw. The only way any sinner can come to Christ is if God intervenes. He he uses the word draw here. This word is used several other times. Most of the time it's used in the Gospel of John. It's used in chapter 18 and verse 11 to speak of Peter drawing a sword. It's used in chapter 21 and verse 11 in reference to drawing the net, the fish, drawing the net to shore. In every case, just about, in which the word draw is used in Scripture, it is always in reference to a lifelessness in that which is drawn or a resistance. Do you think those fishies were clapping their fins as they were taken to shore. And what about that sword? It's lifeless. But one thing that's true about this word draw, every time it's used, there's always success. Always. The sword was drawn. You go read in, in, in John chapter 21, you're going to find that every single one of those fish, in fact, they're numbered, every single one of them made it to shore. That's what happens when the Father draws. There are some who, when they read this here, when it says, the Father which hath sent me, draw him. And you notice it says, except the Father which hath sent me, draw him. That's fairly significant. Because there are those who teach something called prevenient grace. It's a big word, and there are different understandings of that idea of prevenient grace. I'm not going to get sidetracked here into a theological discussion, except to say this, prevenient grace generally means, those who use it generally are saying, that the Father draws everyone equally, and the sinner is the one who determines the success of the drawing. You understand that? And so the Father is attempting. The success does not rest in Him. The success does not rest in Jesus. The success rests in you. How you respond. How you participate. How you go along. Whether or not you make it to the end. It's on you. The success. But Jesus' point is quite clear. Unless the Father overcomes the natural resistance of the sinner. Listen, there's a reason why we pray for those sinners. There's a reason why I pour my heart out in prayer for my children. Why tears have filled, I don't know how many buckets in my lifetime, for those that are close to me. is because I know I am not sufficient to persuade them. I can't make them see. There's required a work, a power that I don't have. But since all that the Father gives me shall come to me, Jesus says, the Father steps in and with cords of love He draws the chosen one to Christ. I say with cords of love. He draws in such a way that we come willingly. Isn't, there isn't this idea of I'm, I'm brought to Christ, but I don't really want to come. No, if I come to Christ, from my vantage point, when I come to Christ, I came because I wanted to come. Isn't that true? You say, well, 
No, there was resistance in my life. I'm not saying there wasn't. There always will be. I'm talking about the end result. There is resistance in the flesh. Because there's things that, like these Jews that naturally do not make sense to us. In all our lifetime, we will rebel and we will follow our hardened heart and our resistant spirit will run the other way. But we cannot ultimately resist what He opens our eyes to see. He draws and we come. He must draw. Or we will not come. And He must draw. And we must come. If you don't come, you won't have everlasting life. Isn't that what this text teaches? When you are enabled to see Him by faith, you will not feel that you're being coerced against your will. You will be compelled to come. That's why, I believe that's why, there are so many who who quickly embrace the what we would call the Arminian explanation of salvation, that it's all up to you. But as you fully understand, because God has opened this thing up to you to see behind the scenes, the the curtain's been pulled back, and when you listen to Jesus, what He's saying here, and what the Scriptures say in other places, you begin to understand it was not so much that I was seeking Him, but that He was seeking me. Don't we sing that? We see that. Well... It says that the Father which hath sent me draw him. How does he do that? How does the Father draw? It is written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. Interesting that Jesus goes to the Scriptures. I find that interesting because I think that's a clue even when it comes to how the Father draws and how He teaches The Scriptures are referred to by Jesus here. The prophets are summarized by Jesus, and it looks like He's probably quoting, at least loosely, from Isaiah 54 and verse 13. When He says, it's written in the prophets, and they shall be all taught of God. This is that gospel promise that's given in Isaiah 54 on the heels of Isaiah 53. This is prophetically what's coming, and this is what's happening. This is the promise that Jesus says is fulfilled in the life of every person who comes to Him. That's what He says. Every person, notice what it says, Every man therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto Me. He says, They shall be all taught of God. I'm asking this question, What does the Father teach? They're all taught of God. What does He teach? In Jeremiah 31, verses 33 and 34, it's quoted. I'll go to the quoted passage in Hebrews chapter 8. The new covenant is stated. It's quoted in Hebrews chapter 8 and verses 10 and 11. And listen to this. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, saith the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts. And I will be to them a God and they shall be to me a people and they shall not teach every man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least to the greatest. He teaches them Himself. They show them Himself. That's what's going on. That's what the Father teaches. And how is it that the Father is known? How is it that He shows Himself? Since none have actually seen Him, do you notice Jesus makes that clear? Not that any man hath seen the Father, save he which is of God, he hath seen the Father. How is it that the Father teaches? And it seems to me the answer is that Jesus is driving at is that I, that's why I came. That's why I came from heaven. I came down. I was sent to be the one that shows 
you. Remember back in John chapter 1 and verse 18? No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, He hath declared Him. And so it is by His Son that He has spoken in these last days. In John chapter 14 and verse 7, If you had known Me, Jesus says, you should have known My Father also. And from henceforth you know Him and have seen Him if you know Me. Jesus says that those who come to Him are those who have heard and learned of the Father. Every man, therefore, verse 45, therefore that hath heard and hath learned of the Father cometh unto Me. And I I see somewhat of a circular thing going on here. Jesus was sent to speak the message of His Father. In chapter 3 and verse 34, and he repeats it again later on in chapter 14. But in chapter 3 and verse 34, For he whom God hath sent speaketh the words of God, for God giveth not the Spirit by measure unto him. And so the Father is teaching. How is it that He's teaching? What is the message that is being taught? It's the message about Himself. It's the message that's being declared from heaven through His Son. And so here it seems that He's telling these Jews, listen to Me. To hear Me is to hear the Father. And coming to Me is the evidence that you've heard and that you've learned of the Father. Later on in the Gospel of John, we're going to see that it is the Spirit that the Father sends to enable us to hear and to learn. John chapter 14 and verse 26. He sends the Spirit for that purpose. And then in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. And by the way, who is the Spirit? How is the Spirit identified in Scripture? He's the Spirit of Christ. And the Father and the Son send the Spirit. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 10. Scripture says, But God hath revealed them unto us by His Spirit. How do we know God? It's by His Spirit. How do we see Jesus? How do we know Him? It's by His Spirit. For the Spirit searcheth all things, yea, the deep things of God. Skipping to verse 13, which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. It's not by way of the great philosophers of human history that we know God. It's by the very Word of God that we know God. Who is the Word of God? Jesus Christ Himself, as John has already expressed. Which things also we speak not in the words which man's wisdom teaches, but which the Holy Ghost teaches, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. We understand from Scripture that God has chosen to use us as instruments in this process of making Himself known. How shall they hear without a preacher? But we are instruments, and that's all we are. The Father must draw as the Son is made known. And that is the operation of the Spirit whom He has sent into the world promise of the Father, the gift of the Father. There must be that inward influence of God by the Spirit that dispels unbelief, that conquers that resistance, that humbles that rebellious heart. That doesn't happen by nature. The gospel is not illogical, but its claims are supernatural. It is therefore resisted by the natural mind. 
Jesus is saying that if anyone comes to Him, it's not on the basis of natural reasoning or scientific discovery. If any man comes to Him, it's because the Father draws him. The Father, the one who sent Him and the one who guarantees to His Son a people. And if you read this passage, and I I hope that you'll spend time reading this passage and seeing the, the weaving of Christ's words as He interacts in the language between He and His Father. This is a united effort. The saving of sinners. And when you come to Jesus, you come to the Father. Jesus said so. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Me. And in Hebrews chapter 7 and verse 25, We're told that He is able to save to the uttermost those who come to God by Him, the Father by Him, by Jesus Christ. So when the Father draws you to the Son, He's drawing you to Himself. Think about that. He's drawing you to Himself. You are entering into an eternal love relationship. You are entering into the family of God. This is amazing grace and it's wondrous love that's being displayed toward undeserving sinners like you and me. And there's a reason why we who have been drawn are thrilled in our souls when even this, this morning as I heard the piano playing first thing, before we even sang anything this morning, I heard the, the piano playing and the song that was being sung ministered to my soul. When our minds and our hearts are, are drawn to that, to the realities of the gospel of Jesus Christ, it affects us. It affects us deeply. And we don't get over the grace of God. We don't get over the love of God because we understand to at least to some degree what it took to save a wretch like just read a devotion this week about John Newton. John Newton never got over his salvation. That's why he wrote Amazing Grace. It's not just a popular southern folk tune that everybody enjoys singing. It's a message about a man who came to know the grace of God in his life. Taken from the place of a blasphemer against God that he denied, that he hated. To a lover of Christ. All he wanted to do for 50 years almost or so of his life was just to minister to poor sinners who needed the same grace of God in their lives. And so Jesus, after saying all that He has said, I think essentially He is saying, there is a way. There is a way. It's impossible by, if left up to humanity, impossible. It was when we were without strength, we couldn't do it. I mean, we look, we look into the, into the history of humanity and we see towers that men have built trying to get to heaven. Religious systems that are built around what we do and, and images of deity that men have dreamed up. Systems of righteousness, rules and regulations that even make reference to a man on a cross. But not satisfied with a man that not only was on a cross, but rose from that, from the dead and reigns today and promises, I will raise you at the last day. 
All because of Him. Nothing, nothing whatsoever to do with me. You see, when you understand, I can't. Unless He does. That that places you in a good place. And Jesus doesn't leave the incapable sinner without hope, does He? He that believes on me has everlasting life. I am that bread of life. Jesus is not in these words. And please, in your attempts to understand the depths of the doctrine that's being taught in this passage and others that may be similar to this, do not ever conclude that Jesus is encouraging anyone to throw in the towel and walk away hopeless. I don't believe that's what He's doing. He is letting us know, as He was these Jews, You need Him. You need Him. But you have your own pride. And you have your own unbelief that keeps you separated from Him. And so what do you need? You need what I needed and need. God to draw us. To overcome every point of resistance and to humble us so that we can come with repentance toward God and faith in Jesus Christ. End of story. Salvation is of the Lord. He doesn't look to us for help. He's not going to change the story to get more in. He's not going to simplify the terms. He's not going to try to make it look more palatable to your natural mind. You are going to have to turn from your confidence in yourself, in your own natural mind called repentance. And you're going to have to believe like a child. He is able. And you're going to have to entrust everything now and forever to Him. Yes, He must draw. And you must come. He will save And He will not share His glory with you. And forever and ever, we will be worshiping the Lamb, won't we? We'll be praising God who is pleased to save our undeserving Son.